I wonder if you've got many collared doves about, eh? Oh, there's still a novelty to chaps of my generation, because they've only spread to this country from Europe in the last 20 years or so. Oh, they're about half the size of wood pigeons, dove grey with a black collar. But the first you know about having them around is the noise they make. Oh, it's a plaintive coo, coo, coo. It seems to go on forever. Oh, it's a boring or musical sound, but they're pretty little birds. And I find it encouraging that any species is spreading when so many are in danger of extinction. <laughs> but coloured doves eat corn, and it's astonishing how quickly they'll discover where we're feeding our pheasants. Now, at this time of year, we put thick patches of straw on sunny patches of woodland roads and scatter grain in the straw. The pheasants finds it, but they have to work hard to get it. They have to scratch the straw away, and as they scratch, the grain sifts through till it's eventually on the ground. So the old pheasants really do have to move a mountain of loose straw to get at the golden grain underneath it. The idea of this is that if we keep them busy, then they'll stop at home. But if they could get the grub easy, then they'd gorge, and they'd wander off to somebody else's patch. <laughs> well, our coloured doves are very cunning too. They hop unobtrusively about among the pheasants, picking up the grain just as they reach it. <laughs> Real thieves they are. Anyway, the reason I ask if you had many coloured doves is that I wish you'd got ours. <laughs> and I'll bet our pheasants would echo that too. Well, now, in Ambridge last week, Jill and Mrs. P had some church cleaning to do. I'll tell you plainly, Jill. It's not as if I take a delight in speaking ill of folks, cause I don't. Especially when I'm standing in church. But it's just not decent, isn't it? He's taken advantage of Mr. Gabriel, and I think it's downright scandalous when he's got to that age. Oh, Walter. Nelson. Oh, I see. A grown man like that doesn't bear consideration. Mm. Is something the matter? No, it's all right. I was just looking at the holly, wondering if I ought to replace some of it. It's lost a lot of berries. I can't think why Aunt Laura wanted to put it over the radiator in the first place. She must have known. It hardly seems worthwhile, does it? At least I wouldn't have thought so. I don't suppose anybody will notice. You're probably right. I'll see what Carol says when she gets here. Yes, well, please yourself. Of course, the easiest thing will be to get rid of those few sprigs altogether. But I have no doubt there'd be loud mutterings about people coming in and interfering with other people's wall displays. Anyway, what were you saying? I beg your pardon? About Nelson taking advantage of his father. Oh, it's the truth. Not that it's any of my business, and I don't pretend otherwise. But I'd have thought that when a person's supposed to be in financial difficulties, they might find something better to do than lounge about in a dressing gown at ten o'clock in the morning. Is that what he's doing? He even answered the door in it, invited me into the house, and then sauntered off down to the gate to collect the milk, bold as you like. When was this? Today. I had to go round there to fetch me feather duster. I'd forgotten where I'd left it till I realised I'd need it for dusting round the woodwork in the choir stalls. I didn't know where to put myself. Wasn't Walter in? Oh, yes, he was there, sitting with his feet on the poof, watching some nonsense on television. He asked me to stay and have a cup of tea. I said I hadn't got the time. You'd think he'd have more sense, wouldn't you? In what way? Building himself up to a disappointment, that's all it amounts to, the way he's carrying on. And it won't be all that long in coming either, if you want my opinion. Yes, well, you're probably right. But Nelson does have his generous moments, you know, along with the shadiness and delusions of grandeur. Oh, well, that's as may be. I'd still like to know what oh. he... Here she is. I'm sorry I'm late. That's all right. Hello, Mrs. P. Afternoon, Carol. We haven't made much of a start as yet. Oh, good. I was just getting ready to leave when Colonel Danby arrived. Some business about a protest meeting. Protest meeting? Apparently there are several people in the village becoming somewhat impatient about the gypsies. And they've decided to make noises. Oh. No, Jean Harvey, for one. Mr. King, for another. That's nothing new, surely. Jean Harvey's been making a fuss from the minute she saw the caravans arrive. Does Aunt Laura, if it comes to that. Well, people have a right to their point of view, Jill. And there's no doubt about it. That 
can, for whatever they choose to call it, is becoming a real eyesore. Lumps of metal and old tyres all over the yes, place. but even so. The thing is, it's got beyond the mere fuss stage. There's a hardening determination to get them moved on forthwith, and a public meeting's being called for. Oh, nonsense. I suppose that's why Colonel Dam is involved as chairman of the parish council. Well, yes. Well, he seems highly embarrassed by the whole episode. And he isn't the only one, I can promise you that. You can see what they've still got to do, Freddy. It's really just a matter of clearing up all the roots and debris and having a bonfire. Yes, yes, I suppose so. They've taken all the useful logs out. In fact, I think they've already sold most of them. They're just waiting to be delivered. At least that's what Dave Tasker told me. Which one is he? The elderly chap. Usually drives the pickup. Ah, yes, yes, yes. If you'd like to meet him and have a word or two... I already have. He, he came by the hall a couple of days ago, wanting to know if we'd any scrap to get rid of. I see. Was Laura at home? No. Fortunately. <laughs> Fortunately, indeed. He does tend to give as well as he gets on these occasions. So do the rest of his family, if any grand his experience is anything to go by. <laughs> you know, I really am sorry for troubling you about all this, John. I realize it's none of my business, but if you'd heard some of the outraged citizens that seem to be monopolizing my telephone line just recently... I can quite imagine. What do they expect you to do, exactly? I think the general idea is that I'm supposed to make you and Carol see reason, or failing that to threaten you with social ostracism. On behalf of Gene Harvey and the rest of the vociferous minority? I'm afraid it's more a case of the vociferous majority, the way things are going. I doubt it. And anyway, you've seen for yourself that it'll probably be only a matter of days before the work is finished. And after that, the taskers will leave of their own accord. Have they mentioned anything about where they might be going to next? No. But then it's hardly likely they would, is it? Not to me, at any rate. Why, <laughs> don't they trust you? Well, possibly, to some extent. But I'm a Giorgio when all's said and done. A what? A Giorgio. A house dweller. Oh. My mind works in a different way, you see, and I don't have the right sense of values. So I could never be fully relied on. Could I? No, I suppose not. I ain't never seen anything so ridiculous in all my life, Jill. I know that red dressing gown and Nelson's might have come as a bit of a surprise, but, but there was no need for her to carry on like that. I think she was a bit scandalized. Scandalized? It couldn't have been no worse if Nelson had opened the door to her stark naked. <laughs> I have an idea you're exaggerating a little, Walter. I know I'm not. Her mouth was hung wide open and her eyes were fair popping. <laughs> I said, good morning, Mrs. Peabam. Anything the matter? And I said, that's harder for me to say, is it, Mr. Gabriel? Well, she does have a few set notions about proper behavior, you know. Yes, but, but why should folks be expected to get up and, and dress at the crack of dawn when they're on holiday? There, there ain't nothing indecent about taking things easy. Perhaps she didn't realize that he was on holiday. Now, of course he is. He's got to sit back and take stocky. Yes, of course. I, uh... I don't suppose he feels like discussing his business very much at the moment. Oh, we had a chat now and then, you mm -hmm. know. He likes to try and explain to me about this problem he's got with cash flow and, and realizing his assets. But I've told him he ought not to worry about it. It's only a matter of time before things get back in order. I see. Not that he could make Jack Woolley understand that. It must have come as something of a surprise to Nelson when he found Jack so unsympathetic. Oh, small-mindedness. That's all it was, small-mindedness. But he'll laugh on the other side of his face before he's finished. You mark my words. Hmm. Anyway, I must be going. Sure, I'll have the tea ready with any luck. Unless she spent the entire afternoon rhyming with David and Phil about the taskers. Who? The gypsies who are working for Carol Tregoran. Or supposed to be. You mean they ain't getting on with the job? Not noticeably. In fact, from what she said when we were cleaning the church yesterday, there's been very little progress for more than a week now. I think she's had just about as much as she can take. Yes, I quite see that. Well, give them our best wishes, won't you? <laughs> right. Bye, dear. Richard seems to be enjoying himself. Yes, I gather. I can't understand it. Oh, why not? You know, how any country-bred boy can bear to waste half the festive season in London is totally beyond me. Oh, rubbish. 
Ian Goring's his best friend. And he's got hardly any friends in Ambridge. Which is why he spent most of Christmas playing disco music in his room, if you remember. That's true. Would you like some more coffee? Oh, no, thank you. Mm. On the other hand, he might have thought it was the best way to avoid all the baleful looks that members of the Tregoran family get while walking through the village. I shan't let it go on much longer, you know, John. Look, it's all right for you. You take the larger view of the whole issue and you can afford to be philosophical about it. I can't, I'm afraid. Why? Because my orchard's in a mess and I'm getting sick and tired of being the cause of local uproar. And this public meeting thing is the last straw. Oh, do you think so? I'm looking forward to it. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I'd quite relish the thought of telling some of these Glebelands people how the rest of Ambridge reacted to their houses being built. When it comes to rural landscape, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, which should put Jack Woolley quite out of the running. John, they have not finished the work, and from what I can see, they have no intention of finishing it. That root and top could be cleared and burnt in a couple of days if they put their minds to it. Well, couldn't it? I imagine so. So what are they up to? Look, if you'd like me to go and have a talk today... I think you'd better. Because I'm not going to have them spinning out the contract like this just to make an excuse for staying here. You can tell him I want the land cleared, and unless I can see some definite action by the middle of the week, I'll move them on and get someone else to do the job. I'm sorry, but there it is. Oh, very well. I'll see what he has to say. Thank you. Are you there, Dad? Hello. No, it's all right. It's only me. Oh. Yeah, I, I thought you said you was going down to Martha's. I did. She hadn't got anything. Hey? Well, nothing at all. No, the only things on the shelves are those packet dinners that bear no relationship to food whatsoever. I think the pictures on the front are intended as some sort of warning. Why, what am you on about? Oh, never mind. <laughs> But what did you expect, Nelson? It's only a village store, you know. You can't expect it to stock anything too fancy. No, I don't. If you want the truth, I only went over there in desperation after going through the fridge and the larder. No, oh, I can't help it if I ain't got the makings of a slap up meal in the house. I never said you could. There's, there's what's left of the joint from yesterday. Uh, and that tin of corned beef. Mm, I saw them. Well, what's wrong then? No, well, nothing. Except that I thought it might be rather nice if we saw the New Year in with some semblance of a celebration. Well, we shall celebrate. Only quietly, that's all. But Dad, I'd like to provide you with a meal you'll remember. Eh? And I'm going to do it once more. But, but how? We'll go out. But I ain't got no cash. Oh, forget I... about that. I'll pay for it. But you... Uh, all I need to do is start phoning around... Of course, it might be difficult to find somewhere decent that isn't already booked up for tonight. But, but are you sure, Nelson? I thought Don't that you... think anything. Just run upstairs and make sure you've got a, a clean shirt ready. Whatever it costs, we're going to enjoy ourselves. You must have some idea, surely, Ava. It's just that we have not found time to discuss it yet. At least not specifically. I see. Do you find that strange? Well... No, I suppose not. But when I decide to get married, the time and place will be the first things on the agenda. I mean, there hardly seems much point in raising the issue otherwise. And not that I want to be rude or anything. That's all right. Jennifer finds it strange also. She even rang James at the police house to find out if he was serious. She didn't. Mm, that's what he told me. Of course, she said she would like to offer her congratulations to him, but he detected an undercurrent of disbelief. Mm, it's most annoying. I don't know why she imagines I am so foolish as to mistake someone's intention. Oh, she's only being protective. And after all, you have given her some cause for concern in the past. Oh? Well, for a start, look at the way you allowed Nick Waring to wipe the floor with you. He did not wipe the floor with me in any way. He gave a pretty good imitation. Nicholas was not a gentleman. for telling me? But the point I'm trying to make on Jennifer's behalf... I really don't think there is any need for us to go dragging up the past, Shula. I'm sorry. I wasn't intending to hurt you. I am not hurt. It's just that you must see... Oh, hello, Brian. Hello. When did you arrive? Only a few minutes ago. I wanted to talk to Jennifer, but I hear she's over at Auntie Peg's. Well, she should be back shortly. Ava, Debbie's lost a strap from her roller skate, and Adam started a rumour that you put it away safely somewhere. It's beside the hall telephone. I found it on the stairs after lunch. Well, would you mind taking it up before they pull the room apart? Of course. Excuse me, Shula. Oh, now what have I said? Nothing. It was me. 
We started off talking about Jim Coverdale, and then somehow or other Nick Waring found his way into the conversation. Oh, Lord. It's quite bad enough with Adam walking around the house whistling the tune from Zed cars all day long, without you coming and stirring it as well. <laughs> Sorry. She's off her head, you know. It might be the perfect match. But for heaven's sake, the man hasn't even bought her an engagement ring. He proposed to her out of sheer boredom. I dread to think what her parents are going to say. You mean she hasn't told them about him yet? Not that I'm aware of. I've assumed she's saving it up as a New Year present. Hmm. Anyway, what are you doing with yourself tonight by way of making merry? Working. Oh, yes, of course. You'll be at the bull, won't you? Until 11. Then I'll be going to ring the church bells with Neil and Uncle Tom and all the rest. I told you, Eddie, I don't want to go to any parties. I've made my arrangements already. You can always change your mind, can't you? Why should I? Because you're going to have more fun with me than swinging about on bell ropes at Old Forest. How do you know? If you don't, there must be something wrong with you, old son. You know, there will be any case if you keep squinting down them gun barrels for very much longer. I've got to make sure they're clean, haven't I? Ah, clean, he says. You've been polishing them for the best part of half an hour. You take it to bed with you as well. Look. Just because I like to look after things. Let's have it a minute. Hey? Eh? It's all right. I'm not going to hurt it. Just want to see what handles. Yeah, not bad. Probably a bit short in the stock for you. Mm, careful. You nearly hit the blooming lamp with it. There's 250 quid's worth there, you know. You must be daft. Why? I got it for 20% below the list price. Well, you could have had the automatic of Alpha 60. Yeah, so you said. But I didn't want it. Yeah. I've done you as well as this. No, it wouldn't. Uh, give it here, will you? Let me tell you something, my son. I've been using a shotgun since I was 12 years old. Yeah, so's Jethro, but it doesn't mean to say he's any good. Uh, I am. Why don't you come and show me, then? Like he says, he's going to. When? Tomorrow afternoon. We're going to have 20 clays each on the practice trap, and the lowest score buys the beer. I told him it was time he put his money where his mouth is. Hmm. I put the quarry? Yeah. Mr. Forrest's going to be there to arrange things. With a good mind to shame the pair of you. <laughs> well, I don't suppose there's anything to stop you trying, provided you pay the fee. Well, I'll think about it. While well, we're driving over to Barbary. Oh, come on, Neil. Stop mucking about and get your jacket on. There's about half a dozen birds just hanging around waiting for me to turn up. Why can't you go on your own, then? I've already told you. The van's off the road. Why are you trying to get it done up the path, the M.O.T.? Well, use your dad's van. That stinks of creosote. He had a five-gallon drum tip over in the back. <laughs> How did he manage that? Oh, I don't know. It's the sort of thing he's always doing. Must be a natural ability. <laughs> Look, if you don't want to come to the party, why don't you just run me over there? You are. You can have a good quick look around. See the thing that takes your fancy. You might never know what you're missing. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Especially if it's that crowd from the Country and Western Club. Doesn't matter who it is. They'll do you more good than sitting in the bowl playing dominoes. Unless you've started weighing your chances with Shoe the Archer. Don't talk stupid. <laughs> I caught you on the raw there, old son. What good would it do if I did drop you off? You'd still have to find somewhere getting back. I'll think about it when the time comes. Well? Well what? Are we going or not? Still no sign of him, Uncle Tom? No, none at all. What on earth is he playing at? It's nearly ten to twelve. I know. I told him quite distinctly that we were all going to be at the church by a quarter to at the latest. We are, except for Neil. You don't suppose he's gone somewhere and lost track of time, do you? On New Year's Eve. Well, I know it doesn't seem very likely, but I don't know what to think, Shula. He's not the unreliable sort as a rule. No, that's what I said the other week, when Dad was moaning on about some oversight up at Hollow Tree. I was given a sordid catalogue of the year's major events, featuring such things as burnt cornfields and stolen pigs. Oh, he's had his moments right enough. I've got to admit that. But all the same... Hang on, who's this? What? Ah, that's him. Oh, thank goodness. I really was giving up hope, you know. <laughs> you were not the only one, either. It is him, isn't it? Neil? Hello? Oh. What's that? I couldn't see you properly in the dark. You've got it a bit fine, haven't you, my lad? Uh, I know, I'm sorry. I got waylaid a bit coming back from Barbary. Barbary? What were you doing there? Uh, I was at a party. Whose party? You do realise Uncle Tom and I have been pacing the flagstones and biting our nails to the quick, wondering whether you'd been kidnapped. I said I was sorry, Shula. The trouble is, by the time I'd taken Marjorie home... Marjorie? I... Who's Marjorie? Do you mean to say you've been running around the countryside with strange women while what you... What do you mean, strange? She's not strange. Well, never mind whether she is or not. Let's just get ourselves inside the church and start getting ready, shall we? Eh? Honestly, Neil. And you can save your arguments for 1980. <laughs> and you haven't very long to wait now. 
You've only just missed her. She's gone to the cinema matinee with Debbie and Jennifer. There's a double Walt Disney showing. Yes, I believe she mentioned something about that last night, now I come to think of it. What can I offer you? I'm sorry? A New Year drink? You must have something. Oh, I'd rather not, if you don't mind, Mr. Aldridge. As a matter of fact, I'm just going on duty. Oh, I see. Sorry. That's why Ava wouldn't have expected me to call round this afternoon. Well, if it's something important, I mean, if you'd like to leave a message... Oh, no. It's quite all right, thanks. I'll give her a ring later on. Oh, just as you like. Anyway, I uh, suppose I'd better be moving. Go and see how Ambridge is behaving itself, eh? <laughs> something like that. I heard a few bangs coming from up the lane as I drove in. Bangs? Yes. You don't happen to know if they're shooting over in Longwood, do you? Well, I should think you've heard some of the shots came from the clay quarry. If it was a few and not just one. Oh, yes, of course. I should have thought of that straight away. Stupid of me. I don't know who's up there practicing, though. Unless it's somebody who's been so disgusted with his performance this season that he wants to put it right while there's still a chance. <laughs> Do you shoot at all? No, I've never really had the opportunity. Or the interest, to tell you the truth. Hello? Is that a lot, Jethro? Yes, fair lot. I know that. You might as well get the gloating over with. You what? You heard. Why should I want a gloat? I oh, haven't beaten you, boy. Don't start that. <laughs> Boy, oh, it's bad <laughs> enough losing to Eddie, let alone you. Well, don't take it too hard. I reckon you made a pretty good showing for a beginner. I only got two more than you. Yeah, but nine out of twenty. It's ridiculous. I can do much better than that. I would have done if Mr. Forrest had been here to give me a bit more confidence. Where did he go to, anyway? Oh, it's had something about George and the Deer Park. I reckon he's got other things to think about. Besides, I'm surprised you've got the gall to expect any tuition. After the way you mucked around last night. What are you talking about? Making him wonder if they was going to be a man short for ringing the bell. Hey, mm. <laughs> look, you heard what Shula had to say to you. It's none of your business. I know. Who is she, then? What? This here woman Eddie fixed you with. He never fixed me up. He doesn't even know her. Oh. The way he was telling me all about it, I thought... Well, you thought wrong. She just happened to have turned up at this party with a friend, and she was feeling a bit out of place, same as I was. Not surprising, either, with all them studded belts and high-heeled boots. <laughs> it was like the last round-up. <laughs> you don't do it. What puzzles me is why you want to go and... Well, I don't know what's Coverdale doing down there. Hey, eh? I never heard the van or anything. Must have left it down the track. I wonder what he's after. Probably looking for Mr. Forrest. Uh, he seems to be more interested in Eddie at the moment. Huh? I reckon we'd better go and see what it's about. Is it your shotgun? Of course it's mine. We just think it is. There's no need to be insolent. I'm asking a perfectly civil question. Yeah, but it so happens I was about to put it in Neil's car. He wouldn't mind handing it back. Have you got a certificate? Well, have you? Yeah. Could I have a look at it, please? Yes, if you want to come back to the farm. You mean you haven't got it with you? No. Hey, what do you think you're doing? I'm afraid I shall have to take the gun into custody until such time as you produce a valid certificate. It'll be waiting for you at the police station. What for? Look, I've told you I've got one, haven't I? You're obliged to carry it with the gun. Who said? Look, I'm not going to have an argument, Mr. Grundy. Produce the certificate now, or this goes with me. Afternoon, Neil. Hello. Something the matter? Nothing at all. Have you got your certificate? Y yeah, in the car. Why? No, I'd just like to have a look at it. What about you, Mr. Larkin? Mine's a town where it always is. You better hand over your gun, then. Eh? Hey? What do you mean? Why should I do that? Because Mr. Coverdale's short of things to carry, that's why. Well, hand it over. The man's waiting. But, Dad, Neil's already explained it to you. Never mind what he's explained. You just keep your nose out of it, Clary. If I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. Oh, charming. Right. There's the certificate. Now you just show me where it says I ought to carry it with me whenever I take the gun out. It doesn't. Well, there you are. What have I been saying? Yeah, but you're still supposed to. You've got to be able to produce it. Oh, now am I expected to know that? You just are, that's all. It was Mr. Forrest that told me when I first bought my gun. Well, it's blooming ridiculous. You've said that before. Ah, no, say it again. To that there Coverdale. Who the devil do you think he is, any road? Confiscating folks' property. Oh, I reckon it was only Eddie that he was out for, really. But he had to take your gun as well, so as to make it look right. Oh, it strikes me he's making a job for himself. 
Why should he come nosing round the clay chute in the first place? You wouldn't have seen Colin Drury round it? No, oh, I don't know. Of course you wouldn't. This bloke's too blasted pleased with himself. I'm daft with it. <laughs> Ava doesn't seem to think so. Oh, and what difference does that make? None. Look, do you want me to make the tea now, or are you going to fetch the gun back from the police house first, or what? I've got to know, because if Mum gets back from Grand's and finds I haven't got anything... To I don't either. want any tea. Oh, don't be stupid, Dad. Of course you do. I told you I don't. What you don't seem to understand, Clary, is that all this is very upsetting to someone like me who's never been in trouble with the police before. <laughs> You're not in trouble with the police, Jethro. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know what else you can call it. It's a black mark against my character. What is? I beg your pardon? Honestly, you don't half like to make yourself important. What do you think they're going to do? Open the file on you? Hmm. Well, there's no way of telling this, sir. Oh. I'm going to put the kettle on. Some of us are famished, even if you're not. Well, try shutting the door behind you while you were about it. That's better. There's no wonder this parlour's looking like ice box. I can't think why you even bother to light that blooming fire. Uh, do you want me to go with you? Where to? Where do you think? The police house? I reckon I can manage on my own, thank you, Neil. Well, I don't mind. Can't help feeling it's partly my fault, as a matter of fact. You'd never have gone to shoot Craze if I hadn't suggested it. I'm glad you said that. The same thought's been crossing my mind this last hour or so. Eh? Not that you're entirely to blame, of course. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm sorry, Joe, he isn't here. How uh, do you mean? Exactly what I say. He did call in this afternoon for a little while, it's true, but... Well, what the devil's she on about, then? Does she think I've got nothing better to do than to trace around the village all evening? Who? Caroline Bourne. She told me, quite distinctly, that Jack Woolley was round at your place. And when was this? Not a quarter of an hour ago. Well, in that case, there must have been a misunderstanding somewhere along the line. Oh, it's a misunderstanding, all right. Don't you worry about that, Mrs. Archer. But if he thinks he can take my head his money, and then allow that copper to come prancing up, making a mockery out the lad, he's got another thing coming. What on earth are you talking about? What copper? That there copper deal throwing his blasted weight about. Time somebody took him down the peg. Look, I'm sorry, Joe, but I haven't the faintest idea... Look, my you... Eddie went up to that quarry in good faith. He paid five pence apiece for the clays and the ground fee on top of it. And then he has his gun taken off him. Just because he didn't bother to take a piece of paper. It's a downright discreet. Now, wait a minute. Let me try to get this clear. Uh, Are you saying that Jim Coverdale came and took Eddie's gun while he was shooting at the clay quarry? He'd finished shooting. He was coming home. <laughs> Nothing makes any difference. I hold Jack Woolley responsible. It's me, Peggy. Are you... Oh, sorry. Oh, it's all right, Phil. I won't be a second. Humiliation, that's what it is. Yes, I'm sure. But if you want me to pass on a message to Mr. No, 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 don't trouble yourself. I'll track him down sooner or later. And I'll give him something to think about, what's more. Yes, well, good night, then. Yeah, good night. Uh, evening, Joe. Oh, evening. Phew. Everything all right? Hmm? Oh, yes. What the dickens did he want? He was trying to get hold of Jack. Evidently, Caroline Bone told him he was round here. Can't imagine how she got that idea. Or why she passed it on. Well, was it something urgent? I don't know. To tell you the truth, I still can't make head and a tail of what Joe was ranting about. Why would Coverdale want to take Eddie's gun away from him? Oh, I can think of any number of reasons. Why, is that what happened? So it seems. But what's that got to do with you or Jack? It was while he was up at the clay quarry. Oh, I see. I wonder what's been going on. I can't think. And to be honest, I don't intend to let it bother me. I doubt whether Jack will either. Oh, I'm not too sure about that. If there's been some sort of incident and it took place on his property... Well, I certainly won't be the one to break it to him. I've already put my foot in it once today, over Nelson Gabriel. Uh -huh. I let it slip how he'd taken Walter to the feathers for a slap-up meal yesterday evening. Really? First I've heard of it. Walter gave Mum all the details this morning. He was as pleased as punch. Yes, I can well imagine. Who paid for it, though? Nelson. What? But he can't have done. Well, that's what Jack said. He intends going into Borchester tomorrow to make a few discreet personal inquiries, whatever that means. I think I know exactly what that means. But Nelson wouldn't try to pass a dud check in a place that's so local, surely. Why not? He tried it at the Bull. He'd have tried it with Martha if Jack hadn't managed to get there before him. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I'll go and get my coat. 
Mustn't keep you waiting when you've been good enough to provide a taxi to the family gathering. Oh, I wouldn't really call it that. You did say it was the car battery you were having trouble with, didn't you? Yes, I'm afraid it's flat. I'd better get Hayden to it. Well, as a matter of fact, I thought we might take it down to Brookfield with us now. What? Oh, but well, still. No trouble. I'll slip it into the back of the Land Rover. Well, if you're sure it's no trouble. No, not at all. Uh, have you got your garage keys? Keep going, Eddie. You'll smash it in half. You try hard enough. You what? Oh, you said you'll smash it in half. That's what you want to do, isn't it? Oh, I'm trying to get some of this concrete out. The stuff you left to go hard because you couldn't be bothered cleaning the barrow. You do realise it's the only barrow we got, the only heavy one anyway. Ah, uh, it's heavy all right. It's heavier every blasted time you use it. What do you want? There's a cup of tea for you in the kitchen. Just made it. Oh. So what you can do with one before you go back to work? Your other work, that is. Yeah, the work I get paid for. And do you want it or don't you? No, I'll be in in a minute. I've got to get that roofing ladder out of the barn and load it into the truck first. Why? So I don't drive off without it. And I'll drop it back at the yard this afternoon. But I ain't finished with it yet. Oh, I can't help that, Dad. I've got this new bloke in the office. And he's spending all his time taking inventories, checking up on where all the plant and tools are, and how long they've been booked out for. Oh. One of them busy types, like Coverdale. Hey. Now, you just watch your step as far as cover deal's concerned. Right. The trouble with you is you never listen to good advice. I warned you about rubbing him up the wrong way. I said if you give him any excuse, he's going to start leaning on you. I might just lean on him one of these dark nights. No, you won't. You'll do as I tell you for a change. Try and find a bit of sense from somewhere. What? When I came in yesterday and said he'd walked off with a five shot, you said that for two pins you'd go and wrap it round his neck. Ah, but that was in the heat of the moment. Now, listen. You want to start an argument with folks in authority, you've got to have the law on your side. I found that out when I got the better of Bellamy. Got the better of him? Yeah. I made him realise it wasn't going to be quite so easy to get me off this piece of land as he thought it was. And I made him give me enough time to get the place back on its feet without that manager of his coming and harassing me every five minutes. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned him. I forgot to tell you about him. Forgot to tell me what? He rang up about uh, half past nine while you were out doing the pigs. Sinclair? Yeah. He wants to have a look at the place, uh, see how the work's progressing. But why the police is sitting you think of it more? I already said I forgot about it. We turn up after dinner, round about uh, two o'clock. To tell you the truth, Uncle Tom, I don't think Andrew knows quite what to expect. He's heard about all the activity at Grange Farm over the last month or so, but whether anything's actually been accomplished. Well, haven't you been another look for yourself then, Peggy? I don't dare, considering what happened on my last visit. Uh, uh, that's when Joe smashed the Turkish head door down with a sledgehammer, wasn't it? Yes, <laughs> to get it ready. Uh, well, I could name a few more round here who'd feel like getting it in from time to time. Yeah. And from what you've been telling me, it looks as though one of them might have succeeded. Do you think it was personal spite on Jim Coverdale's part? Well, I've no idea. But either way, it seems to have spilled over onto poor old Jethro. Yes, that's very unfortunate. Strange that Joe didn't mention it last night. Probably slipped his mind for the moment. It was Eddie he'd be concerned over. Anyway, Mr. Woolley knows now. How's he taking it? Could be taking it more seriously, if he wants my opinion. He doesn't seem to realise what an incident of this sort can point to. I don't follow you. Well, if we got a village bobby who decided to get petty and officious and go out of his way to make trouble oh, for folks... Oh, Phil. You did bring my car battery back around tea time. Oh, I'm sorry, what were you saying? Oh, it doesn't matter. Afternoon, Phil. Oh, Uncle Tom. Oh, that was prompt service. I hope you brought a bill for me. Mm. Oh, no, don't worry about that, Peggy. Oh. Mark it down as a New Year's present. Matter of fact, I'd have had it here sooner if Jack Woolley hadn't phoned and I was leaving the house. Oh? Apparently he's found out that a certain gentleman paid for a certain meal by cheque on New Year's Eve and he wondered what we ought to do about it. Oh, no. There's no doubt about it, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm not with you, Phil. Who are you talking about? Nelson Gabriel. Eh? But I thought he'd got no money in the bank. No, he hasn't. But evidently he doesn't think a little thing like that should be allowed to affect his lifestyle. He will now that Jack's onto him. He would have to be furious. Yes, but what can he do? Stop his gallop was the phrase I heard. Be a bit difficult though, won't it? Unless he wants to go upsetting Walter into the bargain. Obviously. But he'll think of something. You can rest assured of that. There's got to be something wrong somewhere, Dan. Something wrong? Why? Well, you just put your hand on that radiator. You'll soon see what I'm talking about. 
Oh, Lord. There. Now, what did I tell you? Uh, hang on. Let me feel the bottom of it as well. Oh, it's warm all the way through. Well, what good's that? Should be blazing hot at the moment. This hall's like the inside of a fridge. I meant that seeing as it's the same temperature top and bottom, it can't need bleeding. Is that supposed to reassure me in some way? The over 60s are going to start rolling in here any minute. And they'll be expecting to sit down and watch the slideshow in comfort. Oh, I think you're exaggerating, Laura. It's not that cold. And besides, it'll be dark so people could cuddle up to one another. Oh, now, don't be ridiculous. Oh, I bet there's some that won't think it's a bad idea. You're not much help, are you, Dan? Well, I'm sorry, but I don't see there's much else I can do. I'm not a heating engineer. Hey, you don't happen to know whether anybody's been fiddling with the thermostat, I suppose. I know that I most certainly haven't. So there's no point in your looking at me like that. Oh, evening, Jill. Evening. Evening, Aunt Laura. Oh, evening. Sorry I'm a bit late. Oh, that's all right. We're thinking of cancelling the whole show anyway. Unless we can get some warmth into this place within the next quarter of an hour. You mean you're thinking of cancelling it? I haven't said anything. Is it cold, then? You just take your coat and gloves off, Jill, and try standing still for a moment. Uh, you know what your trouble is, Laura? You've been spoiled by all them whacking great log fires that Colonel Danby makes. If the sweat's not running off the walls, you think you're dying of exposure. Well, please yourself. I'm not going to stand here arguing. I've got things to do in the kitchen. But you wait till Mrs. P and one or two more arrive. You'll find that there are still some people who share my opinions. Did that last remark have any relevance to anything, Dad? Well, I'm not altogether sure, Jill, but I shouldn't be surprised if it was meant as a crack at me over this to do with the gypsies. Oh? Aye, we had a little bit of an argument beforehand, you see, round at Glebe Cottage. Oh. She reckons some of us on the parish council are ignoring public feeling in the matter. Yes, I've heard her make a couple of statements to that effect, now I come to think of it. Ah. Isn't that the idea of the meeting next week? So that Mr. King and the rest can put a fire under you? Aye, but I don't know that I shall lose any sleep over it. I told her quite flatly, if she's expecting me to go and badger the Tregorans, she'll have to get her ideas organised. I can't see anybody on the council being prepared to do any badgering. Joe Grundy and Jean Harvey, perhaps. No, and Joe's preoccupied with his own concerns at the moment. At least, that's what I hear. Harassment, that's what it is. Harassment and victimization, pure and simple. Oh, here, Joe. Get that down, yeah. Oh, It'll yeah. make you think the world's treating you better. I doubt it. Takes a lot more than a jar of cider to set me to rights. Yes, well, that'll be 34 pence, please. Oh, yes. Ah, very much. You'd think it was enough to have that copper picking on my head, wouldn't you? Yeah. No, no. I gotta have Ralph fill him his eyed lucky sniffing round me place as well, just to make sure I don't get too much peace and quiet. Eyed lackeys? Ah, Sinclair. Oh, see? Oh, Andrew's been paying you a visit, has he? Ah, this afternoon. Sort of surprise, was it? Well, it wouldn't have been if my Eddie remembered messages. Strikes me he can't remember anything except the daft words on them blasted records of his. I'll cart the old lot out to the bin one of these days. Oh, <laughs> you want to be careful he doesn't put you in after him. Hey. Well, he gets a bit touchy, doesn't he, when he's cross? Hey, look here, Sid Perks, if you're going to start blackening my boy's character, oh, I... I wouldn't dream of it. Hello, Mr. Archer. Hello, oh, do, Sid. Hello, Joe. Evening. Um, I'll have a pint, please, Sid. Ah, pint it is. Ta. How you keep it then, Joe? Oh, can't grumble. Oh, blimey. Uh, something the matter? No, no. Nothing Aye. at all. Nothing. I, uh, I wasn't expecting to see you in here quite too early, Mr. Archer. Me? Eh. Thought you was across at the uh, village hall for the slideshow. I was. It's just finished. I thought Polly's mum said it went on till nine o'clock. It probably will if she stopped behind for the tea and buns. It so happens that I prefer something a bit different. Oh. <laughs> what slideshow is this, then? I heard nothing about it. Yeah, well, now you see what you missed by not going to the over 60s. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, thanks, Sid. Here, yeah, then, take it out of that, will you? Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, cheers. Cheers, Joe. Cheers. cheers. Ah. Yes, it was all about endangered species. Some marvellous pictures of birds. Amazing creatures, the chap called it. Yeah. Some friend of John Tregorum's, isn't he? Ah, that's right. Yeah. Ah, thanks, Sid. Pity Tregorum couldn't have given a talk. About them other amazing creatures, the ones he's got camped at the bottom of his wife's orchards. Be real interesting, that would. Get a plain audience, I shouldn't wonder. If you mean the travellers... Hey, hey, mind out, will you? There's a chap over there by the fire I want a word with. I, I only just noticed him. Sorry. Uh, thank you. He's in a pleasant mood. 
Not that it's anything out of the ordinary. <laughs> no. no, ignore him. He's been grumbling since he come in. And he told me that Andrew Sinclair's been at Grange Farm this afternoon, so I suppose that's got something to do with it. Now, Phil told me he's seen Andrew's car turning into the lane. Uh, I should have known better than to start talking to him. Yeah, there's quite a few that will agree with him, though. You what? About the travellers. Oh, yes. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, Mrs. Archer, but I'm not quite clear what it is you're asking me to do. I'm asking you to look into the matter. Yes, sir, you've said. But what does that mean exactly? Do you expect me to search the vans? Well, I don't Because know. if so, I shall need a warrant and some evidence. All I'm saying is that two of those children were seen fooling around near the car park of the village hall last night. And later on, somebody discovered they'd got a hubcap missing. One hubcap. Well, what difference does that make? And whose car was it that had been vandalised? There is no need to be sarcastic, Mr Coverdale. I'm not. But if a theft is being reported, it would be useful to me to know whose property had gone missing. I am not reporting a theft. I'm reporting a nuisance. I realise that unless somebody actually saw them take the hubcap or saw them with it, there's nothing much you can do. But you'd like me to look into it? Yes. I see. And which children were they? I beg your pardon? You said two were seen. To my knowledge, there are five kids living in those caravans. Well, I think one was the eldest boy. Well, I don't know whether he was the eldest, but he's certainly the biggest. Looks to me as if he's about uh, 12. Oh, ah, yes. Mick. Eh? That's his name. All right, I'll see what I can do. Well, you do understand, of course, that I'm not expecting you to recover the hubcap. I just want to make sure it doesn't occur again. Naturally. Well, I mean, for heaven's sake. If people can't leave their cars unattended in the middle of a village, it makes you wonder what... Morning, Laura. Oh, morning, Tom. Well, what are you up to? Do you want to see me about something? Well, as a matter of fact... I... Because if you do, you can give me a lift home. Well, that's if you wouldn't mind. No, no, not at all. But it was Jim I wanted to talk to, really. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom, but it'll have to wait. Unless it's extremely urgent, I'm due in court in half an hour. Oh. Oh, well, some of the time will do. Yeah, I should be back by mid-afternoon, if that's of any use to you. Ah, right -o. I think it was a great success, John. Everyone I spoke to seemed to have enjoyed it anyway. Mm -hmm. Apart from those horrific pictures taken on the game reserve. Oh, the poachers, you mean? Mm. Yes, I thought that was a bit unnecessary in the circumstances. I know the general idea is to make people vividly aware of what goes on, but I hardly think the dwindling number of elephants will be helped by giving Mrs. Bagshaw nightmares. No. <laughs> she lost her budgerigar recently as well. Oh. So all in all, it was rather too much for her. Oh. At least that was Mrs. P's version. I fully sympathise. Afternoon, Sid. Hi, Mr. Tregon. Mrs. Archer. Hello. Don't tell me they're still queuing. What? For pensions. No, not that I'm aware of. Oh, oh, well, that's a relief. I thought perhaps you was waiting out here until the shop emptied to be. No, no, no. You may, you may proceed with confidence, Sid. We were merely discussing the slideshow last night. Oh, uh, <laughs> he died. It all went off pretty well. It's a pity about that bit of bother with the hubcaps, though. Hubcaps? What hubcaps? I thought there'd been some swiped in the car park. It's the first I've heard of it. Me too. Ah, oh, well, perhaps I've got it all wrong, but... Well, there was a bit of muttering in the public at dinner time. To what effect? Somebody seemed to think that the Traveller's Kids was responsible. Oh, no. Well, I'm only repeating what I overheard, like. Of course. Well, I suppose that's where Jim Coverdale was off to just now. What do you mean? Well, he was heading in the general direction of your place, Mr. Tregoran, and I suppose if a complaint's been made... How long ago was this? Oh, uh, five, ten minutes. It couldn't have been much more than that, because of... Thanks a lot. Excuse me, won't you, Jill? I really must get to the bottom of this. Yes, naturally. Bye, John. Well, you've certainly started something there. Uh, yes, I have, haven't I? <laughs> it wasn't intentional, though. Oh, they're certainly causing some friction. Mm. I hardly hear about anything else just lately. That's because a lot of people in Ambridge are loud-mouthed. Not to say bigoted. They are making a fair old mess, though, Mrs. Archer. That's Carol Togoran's problem. I don't see why anybody else needs to interfere. So in other words, Mr. Coverdale, you have no evidence that any of the Tasker children have done anything whatsoever. Have you? Well, I was given to understand... I don't care what you were given to understand. You have no right to behave insolently to people who are living on private property and minding their own business. When they're allowed to. I'm sorry, I wasn't aware that I had been insolent. Really? Well, it may surprise you to learn that the elderly gentleman whom you were speaking to when I arrived is called Dave or Mr. Tasker, not friend. 
At least not in that derogatory manner. Mr. Trigoran, I'm placed in a very difficult position. Complaints are made and it's part of my job to act on them. Even when they're without foundation. Some of those kids were seen making a nuisance of themselves around the village hall. The only reason I came here was to ask if they could be kept under better supervision. Ask? Well, very well. Insist if you like. Mm. Comes to the same thing. They'll still take damn all notice of me or anybody else. How long have you lived in the countryside, Mr. Coverdale? I'm sorry, I don't see that that's got it. It has quite a lot to do with it. If you'd lived here for any length of time, you'd have discovered that the most vocal elements of village society are often latecomers and a small minority. Yes, but if even I so... I suggest you bear that in mind the next time you feel called upon to take action, particularly when it involves coming onto my wife's property without permission. Do I make myself clear? Thursday the 24th, which would give me one, two... Best part of three weeks. Now... Hello? Oh, Anybody home? No. Mom? Dad? I'm in the office. Hello? Hello? I'm in here. Honestly, if it's not one thing, it's another. Oh, I was beginning to think the house is deserted. Well, it is, apart from me. Where's Mom? Round at Glebe Cottage. Sorry? She's round at Glebe Cottage. All right, no need to burst my eardrums. Look, will you come in or go out? But either way, shut the door, Shula, please. Thank you. What are you so bad-tempered for? I'm not bad-tempered. I've just been trying very hard to get some paperwork done, and I've had nothing but interruptions. Who from? Everybody. First Neil, then Graham, then your mother. What did Neil want? Oh, nothing, nothing at all. You mean he was just feeling depressed and lonely? Oh, don't be ridiculous. He came banging on the door, wanting his hand held over some simple problem he should be able to cope with on his own initiative. Oh. Anyway, why are you interested? No reason. Except that I waved to him across the yard a minute ago and received a very surly acknowledgement. Oh, uh, well, I sent him away with the flea in his ear. Ah, well, that might explain it. I have to know these things. Huh? In case he comes into the ball tonight, still sorry for himself. <sighs> I shall be very pleased when you've stopped serving in the ball. Why? Because it's the way I feel about it, that's why. Look, why don't you go and make the tea? David should be in shortly. And has he been working today? Well, of course he has. He's been giving Fred Wakefield a hand on the ditching. All right. I only asked. You really are in a mood, aren't you? What? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. What is it? Well, I don't know. Sheer panic, I suppose. I've just been through my diary for the next month or so. And with all the things I've suddenly got to do and think about... You'll manage it. Visits here, visits there, drainage officer, ministry surveyor... They come to you, don't they? Yes, but it's all got to be fitted in, and somehow there don't seem to be enough hours in the day or days in the week. And as if that isn't sufficient, I've got your mum staging a Defend the Gypsies campaign, <laughs> Jethro still mumbling about being turned into a criminal, no. and both your granddad and Jack Woolley pressuring me about Nelson Gabriel. Oh? What about him? Well, I'm convinced that unless something is done, he'll keep on passing dud checks around the place until the law catches up with him and brings shame down on Walter's head. Don't you agree with them? Well, well yes, if I stop to think about it. But I don't see what I'm expected to do. Do you fancy a biscuit, Nelson? Nelson! Sorry, what did you say, Dad? Biscuits. What about them? Well, I got some in the larder. Bought them from Martha this morning. I thought you might fancy one with your coffee. Got to have some to finish your supper off. No thanks, I don't think I'll bother. Um, look. Uh, do you mind telling me again what Jack Woolley said? But I've already told you. Yes, I know, but exactly. Well, I told you exactly. There ain't nothing wrong with my memory, you know. I'm not suggesting there is, Daddy. It's simply that I can't make any sort of sense out of it. Oh, seemed clear enough to me. He said he'd like to see her as soon as possible, because he had a proposition to put to you. Yes, but what kind of proposition? Does he mean business or what? Why don't you ring him up to find out? It ain't no use you sitting there asking me questions, Nelson. If you'd have been in when he called... Yes, I know. You said that already. Who is this chap you went to see in Ollerton, any road? Somebody I know is... No, I don't think you ever met him. His name's Morton. Oh. I did him the odd favor from time to time in the old days. Uh, and you thought he was about ready to do you one back. Is that it? Mm, or something along those lines. You're quite sure Jack Woolley seemed amicable, are you? Oh, why don't you go up and see him, same as, as he says? He might want to apologize or summit. What for? Well, well, that misunderstanding as you had. Yes, well, why not? 
We do live in an age of incredibility, after all. Eh? Hey? No, oh, nothing. It doesn't matter. What are these biscuits you keep going on about? Fig rolls or custard creams? Custard creams. They always was your favourites. It's a completely different attitude, Dad. I mean, to the majority of people who live and work in the country, a shotgun's part and parcel of everyday life. Well, Jim Coverdale obviously doesn't think like that. You mean he's prejudiced? Oh, right, possibly. Well, I must say, I don't recall Colin Drury ever creating a fuss like that. No. And look at all that nonsense with Neil. I only found out about it the other day. No, what's this then? Oh, Uncle Tom tells me that Coverdale went round to Nightingale Farm to see where Neil was planning to keep his gun. And he more or less insisted he put locks on cupboards and goodness knows what else. Some folks might call that sensible, Phil. Yes, but it isn't a legal requirement, and he knew it. He was exceeding his authority. Anyway, I suppose Jethro will recover from the insult sooner or later. As I was telling Shula yesterday, I've got other things to think about at the moment. Aye. You know, it's funny to look up there to Lakey Hill and think it'll all be different next year, not having the ewes out there anymore. Uh, yes, I was going to talk to you about that. We ought to make a trip to Rosemorn fairly soon. You know, the experimental husbandry farm. Ah. And see if it's really on. And get some ideas about simple housing. Well, well at least I ought to. Mm. It'll cost a bit. Still, the grants will make it easier if we're eligible. Well, I'm not so sure about that. We might get a percentage if we're lucky, but we still have to find most of the money ourselves. Oh, I don't know. Housing use seems a waste of money to me. Look, Dad, if we're going up to 300 use next autumn, we can't afford to have them out treading all the grass all winter. Yes, yeah, I suppose you're right. Anyway, it's early days yet. What is it? Does he think you're being lazy or what? No, of course he doesn't. I think he just finds it slightly unnerving to have a daughter of my age hanging around the place without fixed aim or ambition. Well, it's hardly your fault you couldn't get your job back straight away, is it? Well, Jack never suggested it was. And anyway, I don't take too much notice of what he says when he gets irritable. It's mostly because he's loaded down with worries about the farm. Yeah. I wish I could get him to pay my hunt subscription, though. Well, tell him you'll pay him back in instalments. <laughs> I don't been a bit sensitive about money ever since that business with the travellers checks oh oh speaking of travellers mm -hmm. ava rang me last night to tell me her fiance had a severe dressing down for mr tregoran have you heard anything about it nothing at all apparently it was all because he'd been rude to the taskers although ava didn't put it quite like that of course oh i see it really does serve him right if you'd seen the way he behaved when we had to go and talk to them about pinching holly he is the most insufferable ma good heavens Oh, hello, Nelson. Uh, good afternoon. How are you both? I'm fine, thanks. Does, does, does Mr. Woody know you're here? I don't think so. Well, then you better leave before he finds out. Oh, well, why? Because otherwise, he's liable to have you dragged round the country park on a rail. Isn't that what you're insinuating, Caroline? Something like that. Uh, unless you've come to settle your outstanding bill, of course. Uh, not just at the moment, I'm afraid. Mm. Uh, where is Jack? I'm not absolutely sure. I think he said he was lunching at the golf club. Ah, well, then perhaps you could get him on the internal telephone for me. Uh, or simply tell him I'm waiting here. Ah, there's your beer, Walter. <clears throat> Thought it was best to date at the bar, save cluttering up this little table with bottles. No, thanks very much, Tom. Oh, well, ah, cheers. Cheers, then. Now then, what was it you were saying a minute ago? Eh? So what about a chap called Morton? Oh, oh yes. Uh, the, the chap Nelson went to see yesterday. Th that's why he weren't at home when Jack Woolley called. Oh? I thought the name rung a bell. Oh, you know him then, do you? Well, not really, but I remember him calling at the cottage a few years back over some of that stuff in the attic. What stuff in the attic? Well, there was a few boxes and things that Nelson stored up there. Oh, ah, yes, that's right, so there was. Ah. So when your roof had to be mended, me and Dan went up there and shifted them round. That's it, Dom. Well, Frank Morton was who they belonged to. Oh, yeah. He had this business, you see, and he was a bit short of storage space. Well, what sort of business was it? Because most of them boxes are full of tins of sardines or pilchards or something, weren't they? Yeah, that's right, yes. And you know, them all long gone now. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. So Nelson's up at Grey Gables now, then, is he? Could be. He said he got one or two things to see about today, in preparation, like. Preparation for what? Well, I, I ain't exactly sure. 
Getting his business interests sorted out, I suppose. What, in Ambridge? Well, roundabout. He's always had one or two hands in the fire, you know. Hmm. Of course, I... I don't know whether he's actually decided as he's going to come back and settle here altogether. Is that what you've been talking about doing then? Well, not really, Dom, but I, I think he's felt a bit more attached to the place this time. If you follow me. Oh, yes. Yes, I follow you. <laughs> Morton, eh? Hmm. Well, must have been a grocery business or something in that line. Because there was hundreds of them. Yeah. Hundreds of what? Well, sardine tins. Oh, we couldn't think what the dickens was supposed to be going on. Come and have a seat, Phil. Well, thanks. And I can't think where Dad's got to unless he decided to pop along to the ball for an hour or so. Well, uh, it doesn't matter. I, I was hoping to catch you on your own. Really? Yes. Well, you're lucky. I only got back myself a few minutes ago. I've just had a few words with your charming daughter. Shula? But you mean you've been up to Grey Gables? Yeah, correct. A little matter I had to sort out with Jack Woolley. Oh, I see. I doubt it, unless you're part of the conspiracy. It is a conspiracy, isn't it? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. The move to get me out of Ambridge, by any means, short of physical propulsion. Oh, now, look, Nelson... It's quite all right, Phil. You needn't have any worries about offending my dignity. I'm well aware of the general feeling around the village. No, I, I think you're exaggerating. I haven't come here because I, I want to get rid of you, Nelson. Mm. I don't know what Jack said, but my only concern is for you to start behaving responsibly. Oh. No, 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 let me finish. <laughs> I know all about that business at the Feathers. The check? Yes. Well, in that case, you'll be glad to hear that it's been taken care of. What? I mean that it's been made good, so there could be no question of any scandal alighting on Dad, which is what Jack informs me you're also afraid of. Oh. You look rather blank. Well, well I, I'm sorry. It's just that I had no idea that... Well, that, It's that, quite you... simple. I was offered a choice. Either I allow my outstanding bills to be paid and make myself scarce before the weekend's over, or Woolley calls the police in. I didn't have to deliberate for very long before arriving at my decision. Oh, I'm sorry. What for? That you've let yourself get into this mess. If only you'd had the common sense... Oh, to... spare me the lectures, Phil. They weren't part of the bargain. Yes, but no... My suitcases are on the bed, and I've got a few more things to pack into them. I don't think we have anything else to talk about. Do you? written by Alan Bauer, producer William Smethurst, was directed in our Birmingham studios by Alaric Cotter.